Well, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. You can see the gospel clearly in this chap in this portion of scripture. And so I'm very excited to get into this with you. Holy Spirit, speak to us through these words in Jesus' precious name. Ezekiel 33, 1, the scripture says this. Once again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against the country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. Now, son of man, I am making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. One little point that I want to point out before we get into the rest of this is this actually is very sad to me because the Lord has given Ezekiel this gift, right? But then he's telling them, telling him how I want you to use this gift. There's people that are supposed to be able to come to the watchman and find out if they're doing wrong. Find out if they're in sin. So that they can repent. And that's what the watchman is to do, is to warn the people. Hey, if you live this way, you are going to be destroyed. One, your life's going to be destroyed because you're going to destroy it by your own sinful decisions. And two, you're, going to inherit, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, but you'll be thrust out of his presence, separated from him forever in hell. And how sad is it that there are, it's like Jesus said, these people look like sheep without a shepherd. There's actually sheep that want to know the truth, that want to be led in the right way. But then there's people that are too timid to tell people the truth. And we should all fear and tremble at this in the sense that we are Christians and we are all ministers of reconciliation and we can all lead people to Jesus Christ, right? But I, I think for too long we've taken it lightly. James chapter 3, not many of you should become teachers. And it's not because you're going to have perfect doctrine. It's, gonna, it's because people are going to have the tendency to let people dictate what they're going to preach, which is going to cause ultimate destruction for the people listening and the people preaching. And so we all need to fear and tremble at that. But I love this. It says, it says warn the people lest they die in their sins. But if, they, if you do warn the people and they die in their sins, I'm not going to hold you responsible for it. They're responsible for their own actions. It says, Son of man, give the people of Israel this message. You are saying our sins are heavy upon us. We are wasting away. How can we survive? As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked people. And we need to understand that. You know, we see often wicked rulers, wicked leaders and we're like, take them out, take them out. Well, I definitely believe in if, if they die by war, that's just, right? That, that, that's righteous. But the Bible says that the military and the police officers are there. They're supposed to be enforcing justice. But we're not hoping that wicked people die and go to hell. We're hoping that wicked people repent, right? First Timothy chapter 2 tells us who to pray for. It says pray for all people and pray for your leaders, because God, and you know what it says in the following verses is God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. God wants the people who are wicked in leadership to repent, come to the saving faith of Christ. Why? Because then his people can live a life marked by godliness and dignity. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? Son of man, give your people this message. The righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin. 
Notice that. The righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin, nor will the wicked behavior of wicked people destroy them if they repent and turn from their sins. You know what this does? It completely demolishes self-righteousness. Because the righteous have to remain righteous, and the righteous should be warning the wicked or encouraging the wicked with the reality that, hey, if you want to turn from your sins, you can be washed, you can be redeemed, and the Lord will not remember your sins anymore. When I tell righteous people that they will live, but then they sin, expecting their past righteousness to save them, then none of their righteous acts will be remembered. I will destroy them for their sins. And I understand right now we're in the Old Testament, but this theme is in the New Testament. Once saved, always saved is not of the Lord. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Jesus says, if, if you remain living faithfully to me, I'll never blot your name out of the book of life. So it, why would Jesus say that if your name couldn't be blotted out of the book of life? Now, this is not if you commit an act of sin. This is if you turn aside to sin and you embrace it and you want it. It says, and suppose I tell some wicked people that they will surely die, but then they turn from their sins and do what is just and right. For instance, they might give back a debtor's security, return what they have stolen, obey my life-giving laws, no longer doing what is evil. If they do this, then they will surely live and not die. None of their past sins will be brought up again, for they have done what is just and right. They will surely live. And I want to show you an example of this. Turn to Jonah chapter 3. The Lord is not looking to destroy anyone. He wants all to repent. The Lord will destroy those that are in sin because he has to destroy sin. And that's why Jesus came, was to save us from our sins, so that we don't die in our sins, because if we die in our sins, he has to pour out his wrath on sin, <laughs> right? It says he's coming to, to remove all stumbling blocks, all things that cause sin, and all those who commit sin. Jonah 3.1, the scripture says this, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, and deliver the message I have given you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. You know, what's fascinating here is the Lord didn't tell them that they could repent. You don't see Jonah say repent. You, say, you see Jonah waltzing into that city saying God's going to destroy you people in 40 days. And that's why the king says, perhaps even yet, maybe the Lord will change his mind. That is faith. Wait a second. If, if we're going to be destroyed, we need to seek God. We need to pray earnestly to God. And then he calls a fast from the least to the greatest. Even the animals can't eat, and we're going to seek God. And when the Lord saw that hunger, he didn't destroy them. And even the prophet wasn't in the right mindset, and he wasn't even happy that God relented from that destruction he wanted to see them destroyed but praise the lord that we have a merciful god that doesn't want to destroy people so let's go back to ezekiel chapter 33 but i love that when the lord said i take no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked and we'll go to verse 17 
Your people are saying the Lord isn't doing what is right, but it is they who are not doing what's right. For again, I say, when righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and turn to evil, they will die. So that's a, that's a warning for us who are living righteously. But when we receive this warning, I love what the psalmist says. Your warnings are a safeguard to me. Your warnings are not this. They don't bring me into despair or into depression. They're life-giving warnings. But if wicked people turn from their wickedness and do what is just and right, they will live. O oh, people of Israel, you are saying the Lord isn't doing what's right, but I judge each of you according to your deeds. Well, Sam, that's the Old Testament. What does Romans 2, 6 say? That God will judge everyone according to their deeds. That's not the only place. We could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We could go to um, Revelation chapter 11. We could go to Revelation chapter 20. We could go all over the scripture. We could go to Peter. Verse 21, on January 8th, during the 12th year of our captivity, a survivor from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has fallen. The previous evening, the Lord had taken hold of me and given me back my voice. So I was able to speak when this man arrived the next morning. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, the scattered remnants of Israel living among the ruined cities keep saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he gained possession of the entire land. We are many, surely the land has been given to us as a possession. So tell these people, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You eat meat with blood in it. You worship idols and you murder the innocent. Do you really think the land should be yours? Murderers, idolaters, adulterers, should the land belong to you? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, those living in the ruins will die by the sword. And I will send wild animals to eat those living in the open fields. Those hiding in the forts and caves will die of disease. I will completely destroy the land and demolish her pride. Her arrogant power will come to an end. The mountains of Israel will be desolate, so desolate that no one can even travel through them. When I have completely destroyed the land because of their detestable sins, then they will know that I am the Lord. Son of man, your people talk about you in their... Now look at this. Here's why I'm not for flattery. I can't tell you how many people like to flatter. I've heard all things. I've heard a lot of wild compliments come my way but look at this this will keep you humble son of man your people talk about you in their houses and whisper about you at the doors they say to each other come on let's go hear the prophet tell us what the lord is saying so my people come pretending to be sincere and sit before you they listen to your words but they have no intention of doing what you say their mouths are full of lustful words their hearts seek only after money you are very entertaining to them like someone who sings love songs with a beautiful voice or plays fine music on an instrument they hear what you say, but they don't act on it. But when all these terrible things happen to them, as they certainly will, then they will know a prophet has been among them. And I love that because Jesus wasn't, he received praises, right? He did receive praises when he was riding on the donkey's colt through the city. But Jesus was not walking around looking for people's compliments. And the Bible says it's because he knew what was in people. He knew people were fickle. He knew who would betray him. He knew who would turn their back on him. I mean, if you look at in John chapter 6, a passage we like to frequent, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, and then they come to him the next day, and the, the first thing Jesus says is, you did not seek me because you saw the signs. You, you, you're seeking me today because you ate the loaves and were filled. You liked the blessing that I gave you, but you don't want anything to do with me. And he said, all right, here's what we're going to do. If you want to live, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then the scripture says this in John 6, 66, that many turned back from him and did not follow him anymore. So Jesus wants people to love truth. It's wonderful to bless people. But you can bless people and keep people around by blessing. But it... I'd rather just have the truth expose people's hearts. And if you want Christ, have him. If you don't want him, go away from him. But I love this because even the righteous people need to understand that if I turn from my righteousness and, and I regard iniquity in my heart, I love this scripture. If I regarded iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not hear my prayer. You want your prayers answered? 
You want to live a life of prayer before God and see heaven invade earth and lives transformed and delivered from sin? Don't regard iniquity in your heart. That's actually one. If you get a heart for the lost, you're going to hate sin because sin will obstruct your effectiveness to win the lost. But never forget this. Like As we see the days get increasingly more wicked and more wicked because lawlessness brings deeper lawlessness, don't look at the wicked and act like they can't be saved. I, what was it? Four years ago, I got saved. And we're all here because the Lord saved us in recent times, right? Yeah. And we wanted nothing to do with Jesus. I know I didn't. But the Lord came and saved me. He had mercy on me. Paul said it this way. He said, the Lord had mercy on me to show that the Lord is patient with even the worst of sinners. And so I'm telling you, well, actually, this has been happening. Transgender people have been getting saved. Now, we don't have to reason how that all works out, okay, in the body. It's nothing to do with that. This is about people's spirits, and then they give their lives to the Lord and make the proper adjustments. But I'm telling you, the, we're living in an increasing dark hour, but the Lord wants to, to save people out of their deep darkness, not destroy them. The whole reason, turn to Second Peter chapter 3. Bear with me if I read this last week. I can't remember. No, I read it recently. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter says, This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately or willfully forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Sounds like what we read in Ezekiel 33. But wants everyone to repent. He wants the righteous to remain in their righteousness that was given by Christ. And he wants the wicked to repent and become righteous. Never Here's what I see. I see over years, because we, we've talked to a lot of people, I've seen over years the righteous will let little bits of sin come into their life, and then they'll look down on the wicked. If you regard lust in your heart, don't be calling out a homosexual, according to Christ. I'm just saying. Because to allow your heart to be given over to lust is as bad as committing adultery, at least in the sight of God. So he's causing us to tremble at his word. And I, this verse is important. Guard your heart above all else, for out of it flows the issues of life. Don't let anger creep into your heart. Hold up the shield of faith, quench all the fiery darts of the devil, or if one hits you, you're going to have a rough time getting rid of it in your heart. Stay fervent and built up in the Holy Spirit. Pray it. You know something? Pray in the Holy Spirit, whether it be in English or in tongues. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Stay in the Word of God. Get a word from God weekly and meditate and mull on it over in your heart until you take on the form of that word that you read. Let the Word of Christ live in your heart richly, or else other things will. Or else entertainment will be what I'm pondering on until I can get home and sit before my TV. Or even me. I, I love to sit around and relax. Believe me. 
But when I'm sitting at home alone, I have a choice. I can seek God and prepare for the coming week or day or whatever. Or I can allow myself to let my guard down for a little bit, and that's fine. But you'll notice something. Whatever you give yourself to, you'll cultivate a desire for. You'll start to think on it more and more. And then the doorways to your heart are more open. And you're, you're not as victorious in your walk with the Lord like you were before. So let's be diligent. Because if the righteous forsake their righteousness, they'll be destroyed along with the wicked. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Speaking of the coming of the Lord and him destroying the wicked, it says that he'll return in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you, for you believed what was told you about him. I love that. But not only is he destroying the wicked, he's destroying the wicked in our midst. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there was a man in immorality, and Paul says, throw him out of the church. They, they weren't sobered by it. They weren't keeping that mindset of holiness. And Paul goes to say that they were even boasting about it. Whatever that means, I'm not quite sure. But they were fine with it going on in their midst. And Paul says, you should be weeping. You should be sorrowful that such a thing is done in your midst. And Paul said another thing in, late in 2 Corinthians. He says this. He says, I fear that when I come to you the next time, I'll find that some of you have not repented of your slander, your gossip, your jealousy, and your immorality. I fear that you have not repented. Paul's trying to get people to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and we can't get to the first rung of Christianity, turning from sin to God, turning from idols to serve the living God. Until we can get there, we have no business trying to teach people anything else. I lo Who loves Jesus? Who loves the character of Jesus? Who loves the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Okay, I want to see the world populated with people that are bearing the fruit of Christ. Yes. There's only one way to... I'm not going to... I like to say this. Because Christians, they like to think that they continue in their, can continue in their immorality and claim that they know Jesus Christ. Listen, we're, on, we're all on a level playing ground. If you're sexually sinning in the world and you're sexually sinning in the church, you're both going to hell. There is no sanctified sexual immorality. Does that make sense? Because we claim we're sanctified, we claim we're righteous, yet we're doing exactly what that person down the street is doing, and then we're looking at them like, hey, you should come to Christ. Why aren't you with Christ yet? And the question would be, why aren't you with Christ? You're the one that's supposed to have the knowledge. And it's the same thing. It's that same spirit that was getting people in Romans chapter 2, when Paul says, you like to judge other people and you like to boast that you have the law, but you, dis you dishonor God because you break the law. We all need to cultivate this space for the Lord to invade our lives every day so that his life can flow in us, produce his life in us, his fruits in us. And then we're not going to have to strive to put on love, strive to put on joy. It, it, one of the quotes, I don't even think I got to it. Well, let's look at it. I love it. We'll end on this. I pray that this, this bless you. It says, enjoying the Lord is the source of the joy of the Lord. Enjoying the Lord is the source of the joy of the Lord. We can all slip into this, I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to have joy. I'm trying to have peace. I'm trying not to sin. Um, who's the center of all that? You. I'm trying. And the Lord's like, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. That, that's what we need to do this week. Stop trying. Try to get to the feet of Jesus if you're going to do anything. And let his life fill you. 
every every bit of Christ-like character you have came from him. But we can slip into this mindset, oh, I'm not doing good in this area, and I'm not doing good. It's amazing what 30 minutes in the presence of the Lord that you got can do for your heart and life. Where you realize, like the scripture says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're weak, but in him, we're strong. It shows the surpassing greatness of his power, not of our goodness or greatness. I live godly because I'm filled with God. He's your hope this week. Remember how we started this all out with? Our help is in him and our hope is in him. He's the maker of heaven and the earth. Surely he can do a mighty work in your heart. And remember what Paul said? He said that work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's the Lord who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God sees you. God's working in your heart. He's been working in your heart this week. So let's just yield to him and he'll produce his life in us and through us. Yes, the Bible says to mortify the deeds of your body. If, if, if sin is having its way with your body, if you're giving yourself over to it, then by the Spirit of God, you put to death the deeds of the body. But don't think you can't come to him. He's the one who is our help. He's the one who is our aid. So run to Jesus and be filled with his life this week. So Father, we thank you that we could come into your presence and hear from your precious holy word. We thank you for teaching us, for instructing us, for leading us and guiding us. Our help is in you, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Strengthen your people in their inner man with your might, God, in Jesus' precious name, by the power of your spirit. Cause their hearts to delight in you, to long for you, and to love you. Teach us to pray all throughout the day, in every situation, and in every way. We love you and we honor you. We thank you that you love us, that you desire us. And so we respond to your invitation that says, seek my face. We say, Lord, your face we shall seek. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. Well, Sam loves you. More importantly, Jesus loves you. And First Love Church loves you. So have a blessed Sunday.